All right. I think we are now live, guys. I want to thank everybody for tuning in with us. I have got Coach Rick Cleveland with us this evening. How you doing, Coach? Bernard, I'm, I'm uh, probably way too blessed to be stressed. So that's uh, <laughs> pretty much where I am. Thank well, you for I appreciate you. Oh, absolutely. My my pleasure. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're with me tonight and we're going to have us a good little chat and head on down memory lane a little bit. And for those of you who don't know Coach Cleveland or didn't have the pleasure of playing for him back in the day, Coach Cleveland was part of the early early years of the program. And I'm gonna, I don't want to butcher the, the parts that he did. So I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself a little bit, if you don't mind, Coach. And how were you part of the, the Northview program back in the day? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, my wife, her dad was a Methodist minister and uh, he was a district superintendent of the uh, Dothan district of the Methodist churches. And the job came open there and um, coach Kirkland had, had retired from coaching and their basketball job was open. And uh, I was at Banks high school in Birmingham with David Cutcliffe and I love Birmingham, loved inner city basketball. And um, David told me, he said, Rick, I'm probably going to leave here within a year or two. And uh, he had a, an, an opportunity to go to, to Tennessee with, uh, with Philip Fulmer. And um, Fulmer was the offensive line coach at the time, and he needed kind of a, a, a graduate assistant. And David was ready to do that. So David went to uh, Tennessee a couple of years later. But I got out of banks at the right time. And was fortunate enough to be hired as head basketball coach at Northview to follow with just an amazing man in Coach Kirkland and uh, to get to work with a man like Harry Wayne Parrish at such a young age. I was still a kid, really. Um, and uh, to be around great coaches like Randy Hicks and Bubba Johnson and Floyd Griffin and, and just so many, you know, just really good, good people, Jerry Andrews. Uh, it was really a thrill for me as, at a young age to, uh, to get that job. And of course, I got the chance to coach a little Bernard Nomberg is uh, on the ninth grade football team, and oh. we were pretty stinking good, to be honest with you, but not because of coaching, because probably because of lack of coaching, and you guys uh, just did a tremendous job and, and were pretty doggone good, so that's pretty much what we did there. Well, you're, you're very complimentary, Coach, but thank you, and we're going to dive into that in just a minute. How old were you when you were first hired on at Norfew, and what year was your first school year? Well, my first year was was 80, 81. Uh, you know, I get confused. We, we won a state championship in 81. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I, Harry Wayne's first three years, what, were 78, 79, and 80. I think I came in uh, on the 81 football season. So in 1981, I was there. Um, and that was a thrill for us because I was, what, I'm – let me see, Bernard. I'm trying to think how old I was. I was uh, 54, 74 is 20. I was right at 28, 29 years old. I was a young, kinky-headed boy then. Wow. You weren't even 30 years of age at the time. I was, young. I was young. And so you were hired on to be the head basketball coach? Yep, I was. And what other responsibilities did you take on at that time? whatever Harry Wayne told me to do. It, <laughs> uh, if I needed to go up to uh, to the service station to fill up a truck with gas or, but uh, in all actuality, it was really just coaching ninth grade football at the time. And uh, I think the reason for that was during those days in time, uh, basketball coaches, I think you, you, you hired football coaches to be basketball coaches and, I had been the defensive coordinator at Banks with Coach Cutcliffe, and uh, my daddy had made it real clear to me, if you're going to coach in Alabama, you need to be a head football coach someday. Mm -hmm. But I love basketball, and basketball had been my ticket for in my, in my earlier jobs. And so that, um, you know, I just got lucky and got the job. I'm sure there were a lot more qualified people, but Coach Parrish and the group uh, – uh, I got the job and probably I got the job for, you know, just to be honest with you, the superintendent and my father-in-law were good friends and that might've had a lot to do with it. Probably not fair, but that might've had a lot to do with it. 
Well, Coach, we got a bunch of folks who rolled in and are saying hello to you. I'm going to throw some names to you. Maybe you remember some of them from back in the day. John Reddick, Josh Andrews, who is Coach Andrews' son, Eric Easley, Bruce Johnson, Tara Wade Estes, Jason Mullins, Shane Cobb, several of those folks were, were during your tenure, and most of them have, have put some messages saying hello to you. So thank you, guys. Well, thank you for that. And, and John Reddick is a guy that I've kind of kept up with for a long time. He was a tennis player, a really good tennis player there at Northview. And mm -hmm. I had a, a history in tennis and tennis kind of carried me all over the world, to be honest with you. And But John was a was a really, really good tennis player. And I've, I've seen him several times here in Mobile in the past. I saw Bruce on with you a couple of weeks ago. You talking about a, a dead gum good football player. You know, they talk about press coverage. I know when you were Vanderbilt, you learned a lot more about press coverage. But uh, there's a kid that could – he could press uh, just about from the first day he stepped on the practice field. Oh, Bruce, Bruce could cover anybody. Didn't matter. Yeah. Cover anybody. Miss Shirley C. has joined us. Philip Braswell, C.C. Dixon, they all say hello to Coach. Thank you guys for rolling in. Yeah, that's nice. And I really want to say something to Cece. Cece, I, I get to play golf with Cece's dad, Tom, frequently. And uh, uh, golly, that's a lot of memories you're bringing out now. Lots that's of right. memories. And there are going to be some more, Coach. But I, I came into to Northview as a ninth grader in the fall of 82. And you were, of course, the, the varsity basketball coach at the time and the ninth grade coach for football with Coach Tribune. And right. – the practices down in that bowl were never fun. They were never designed to be fun. But I, I always thought, looking back, that they had a real designed purpose. And part of that purpose, and I've got a question, I'm, I'm coming to it. And part of that purpose was we're down in that bowl watching the JV and the varsity do their thing up on the main field. And that's where we all wanted to be. We all admired those older players. We all thought they were so tough, so awesome, coming off of a state championship team. And being down in that bowl, there was, there was or the, the, the pit or the hole, whatever you want to call it, there was no grass. There was nothing of any luxury like grass down in there. But what was part of the philosophy about you're bringing up, you're bringing up a middle school, a middle school trying to turn them into varsity players? players. Well, I think one of the great things that Harry Wayne did, and, and, and let, let me say something about Harry Wayne Parrish. Mm -hmm. uh, as a young coach, there was no human being that, that God put on this earth for a young coach to be around than Harry Wayne Parrish. Um, I mean, everything about Harry Wayne Parrish was class. And um, he is a, a man that, I hold in the highest esteem and just think the world of him. And one of the things that he wanted to do was to make sure that when those kids got to the varsity, that they knew how to do, you know, had they were fundamentally sound. They knew how to block and tackle. They knew how to run a triple option. And, you know, and I kind of cut my teeth on the triple option because of coach Parrish. And um, he, he was really, he, he cared about those kids down there on that bottom field. And when I became a head coach, I know that was one of the things that, that always stuck in my mind was that Harry Wayne always cared about those kids. Now, a lot of coaches, I'm telling you, Bernard, and I've been in this business for 42 years, those kids will be practicing down there and they don't even know their names. Mm -hmm. Harry Wayne knew everybody's name. He knew everybody's parents. And he always had something positive to say. And I think the thing that he wanted more than anything was to make sure that we kept kids and didn't run kids off. And that's, uh, I, I think that pretty much explains kind of what our philosophy was at that time. Well, coach, I can remember as a ninth grader, maybe the first week of school sitting there with some of my buddies and coach Parrish coming around and I knew who he was. I, I did not have a strong desire to be part of the football program. Baseball was my love. Still, <laughs> and I remember him coming up to our group and he knew each person's name by their last name. And I was the last one he came to. And he says, I'm going to see you on Monday. I said, coach, I'm, I'm playing baseball. So I've, I've got to get ready for base. He said, no, I'm going to see you on Monday. Well, guess where I was on Monday. I was out there. <laughs> yeah. 
And I can remember one of our first practices, you had most of us, you and Coach Tribute, just to see who could throw a football. And you yeah. just get everybody the football, and I must have thrown it further than anybody else. I guess that's where you end up sticking me because I didn't play that much. I, I played tight end and some other positions in, in middle school, and I did some kicking. But I guess I could just throw it a little bit further. But we had so much speed on that ninth grade. Frankly, anybody could have been quarterback. <laughs> well, we weren't going to throw it a whole bunch, Bernard. You know, that wasn't what we were going to make a living by. Well, so, with Larry, uh, with Lawrence Dossey and, and Harry Stanley and um, Morris, uh, what was Morris's last name? I'm thinking I've got his picture of his face. It'll come to me in a minute. His nickname was Food Stamp, which I always thought was a terrible name. Um, Jim <laughs> McKenzie. I mean, there was so much talent in that ninth grade team. Did you guys have any idea that eventually – We'd be a pretty good JV and then an even better varsity team. Well, if you remember, you were pretty doggone good as ninth graders. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't remember exactly what the record was, but you won a whole lot more than you lost. We did. And, we did. and we beat some really good teams. But you think about Harry Stanley and, and you think about Lawrence Dawsey, kids that could just really run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that you can't coach is you can't coach speed. I mean, you can – Teach, Floyd Griffin did a great job of, of implementing methods where they could get a little bit faster, but God blesses you with speed. And uh, that's, uh, we, we had a lot of it. And we had a few trick plays too. We had some gadget plays that we would run with those guys too, Bernard. And that was a neat thing. Well, I, I recently looked back at our ninth grade team photo and we had over 50 players on yeah. that ninth grade team. Now, of course, yeah. It, it, as attrition occurs, I think we ended up graduating four years later with about 17 to 18, but some yeah. outstanding athletes in that ninth grade team who went on to play other sports as well. And before I get away, it gets away from me, Keith Rice, a man you know very well, Matt Blevins, Michael Henry have all joined us. So thank you, fellas, for stopping in for a minute with Coach Cleveland. You know, Michael Henry, I, let me say something about Mike Henry. Mike Henry has become one of the, one of the outstanding young basketball coaches in this state. He did a great job at several places. I know at Ufala, I tried to keep up with him. And congratulations to Mike. He just got the job at Carroll of Ozark, and that excites me for him. And we're going to have to get him on our radio show here pretty soon. Well, it's going to be a race. He's going to be on my show in about two weeks, so I'm looking forward That's to good. it. Well, it's either next week. Mike, let me look that up in a few minutes. It's either next week or in two weeks, but – Congratulations, Mike. Very, very worthwhile and, and uh, wish you lots of luck and uh, coaching at, at Carroll. Well, Coach Cleveland, let's let's fast forward. We're going to jump around just a little bit. Tell folks what you're doing. I should have started out this way. I know you're in Mobile and you've got an outstanding radio program, but tell folks what you're doing these days and what keeps you busy. Well, Bernard, thank you for asking that. I've been at uh, UMS Wright for 17 years. This is starting my 17th year this, this coming year. I just got a contract today, as a matter of fact. Um, but i um, been there for 17 years. I uh, coached football for uh, the first uh, 14 years. And then they were gracious enough. I think I'd had enough. And uh, uh, it was it was time for me to go to pasture. And... Um, but to coach football there for the 14 years and ran the, the men's, the boys' tennis program. And um, it's been a good run for us. We, uh, we set state records in, in high school tennis, set a national federation record. We won nine state championships, eight in a row, eight state championships in a row there, um, and set a national federation record by winning every event in the uh, 2011 uh, state tournament. Uh, some really good players, very average coaching, but really good players. And uh, so we've been really, we've loved coaching tennis there. And it's really, a it, it's, it's a full-time job. We won the 2008 state football championship here. I coached the offensive line on that team. And uh, since that time, um, I'm just kind of, I, I told them I'd coach anything. If they would let me get out of football, I'd coach anything. And uh, they said, coach, if you'll coach middle school basketball, uh, that would, that would 
really help us because we just had volunteers coming in and it just wasn't working out. And so I coach eighth grade basketball and coach varsity tennis and teach five classes of American history. And I think it's, and, and Bernard, I don't say this to, um, to, to say anything negative about public schools because I'm a public school guy, as you well know. But uh, UMS Wright is the finest school of, of higher learning that I've ever been around. It's got great administrators, uh, and Keith Rice is, is one of them, and they've just done an amazing job, and they're great kids. I have about 1,200 kids at UMS Wright, and um, I really changed my attitude about private schools very quickly after being in public schools for 26 years. But, uh, I, I, and I love, absolutely love UMS Wright. Don't know how long I'll be there. Uh, probably another couple of years until I have to go to pasture, but uh, I absolutely love it there. And uh, they've been great to me. And uh, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful journey for me here at UMS Wright. Live in Daphne, don't live in Mobile, live across the bay and love it here. Well, it is as busy as you are, and it sounds teaching five classes, coaching two or three different uh, complete teams. How do you also have time to have a long-standing Saturday morning prep sports radio show? How in the world do you do all that? <laughs> well, I got two guys that really had, came on board with me. Uh, Corey LeBounty came on board with me about eight years ago. Mark Lassiter, who is a uh, uh, going to be a Hall of Fame football coach in this state, uh, is also with me now. He coaches at Bayside with my friend Phil Lazenby. But those two guys do a whole lot. Matter of fact, I play probably too much golf and um, uh, to, to, to keep everything going. Corey kind of coordinates everything as far as getting guests and so on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's a labor of love, Bernard, just like you're, you're doing on this, uh, this conversation. We've been doing this for 17 years, and it started out just as a um, just as a high school sports show, and uh, it has evolved into a really a ministry for us. It really uh, is. So it we really, absolutely it really sounds like y'all have a lot of fun on that show. This list, <laughs> we of three of y'all yeah. banner back and forth, and the stories you probably are now each finishing the other stories, and between the three of y'all, you probably know just about any sports figure coach and athlete in the Mobile metro area uh, who's been around in the last so many years. Well, that's the beauty of, of what I've been able to, to just be involved in, mm -hmm. you know, having coached in Birmingham, inner city Birmingham, uh, being in Dothan with, with the great people of Dothan. And, and, you know, there's not many coaches in this state that one of us don't know. And uh, <laughs> so we, we, we do. We have a lot of fun on there. Well, Coach, it, it's all such great stuff and well deserved for you. But let's let's pivot back. Let's head back in our time machine, back to the early to mid '80s. What was being on Coach Parrish's staff, uh, being the basketball coach? What was the 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 school spirit like? What was it like coming to school and, and working in such a new school, a large uh, school? Uh, with a lot of high hopes and a lot of just fantastic athletes on those early rosters. That was amazing, Bernard. I, you know, you talked a little bit with, I think, with Lawrence about the, the pep rallies. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in a lot of schools. Uh, I've coached in a lot of different places. But there's never been a school that had the school spirit that Northview had. You know, I can still see Dr. Smith up there, don't meet me there, beat me there, mm -hmm. and stomping his feet. And, I, I mean, it was you just nobody can imagine what that was like. I, I just wish that uh, they had uh, kept videos, and maybe that somebody has. Uh, maybe Beth Hemby or somebody's got videos of those pep rallies. But uh, boy, it was some kind of school spirit, and I, I've never been in anything like that, never before. And uh, but it was it was something to uh, to behold every, every Friday was something really exciting. And the cheerleaders did such an amazing job coordinating everything and making sure that, uh, everybody was involved in that pep rally. One of the things, of that, the I, things that I failed to ask, failed to ask was how did the schedules get put together? Were you part of any of that? I missed a little bit of that. What did, what was your what schedules are you talking about? 
the, the varsity, the varsity. You know, I'm getting some feedback, so I don't know if it's on my end or, or not. So I'll, I'll try to behave here. The, I'm talking about the varsity football schedules. I know that we were in a, we were in an area, so we had set games. And then we had a few traditional rivals we played out of Montgomery, et cetera. But were you part of any of the schedule making back in the day? No, that was Harry Wayne. Harry, and, and, and that's the way we do it um, and still do it today. The head football coach generally makes that schedule out. And that's exactly, you know, what, what happened with, uh, with us at Northview. And Harry Wayne, it, and really, I would imagine it got even tougher after 85, after you guys won a state championship to get non-region games, get outside games. We, you remember, we went to Chris County, Georgia. Um, we, I mean, we played all over the place. Uh, uh, so early, early on, um, we played our region schedule and then whatever games Harry Wayne could pick up. That's who we, you know, that's, that was all him. And he, he did a great job of that. I may have to, to give him a call and find out a little bit more about that. But during my years, we played at America's Georgia, which was no yep. fun. They beat the stew out of us. We would go down to Panama City to play Walton. Uh, of course, yep. we went over to Mobile several times. Uh, there was one year after me, maybe in 90 or 91, where I think that they played at Mobile three out of four weeks. Uh, during a, maybe in toward the end of the season, maybe into the playoffs. Yeah, Bernard, that that happened because we had we had to realign regions mm -hmm. and Dothan and Northview uh, had to drive all the way to Mobile and play some of the Mobile schools because that that was the only way they could get a, an eight team region mm -hmm. and that was unfortunate but they changed that so thank goodness they changed all of that yeah and then we had the 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 real pleasure of playing the Opelikas and Phoenix Cities of the world which are traditionally <laughs> always been so, so powerful but I'll tell you the one school if you look back at the the records of the history of the program that has been such an Achilles heel for Northview all those years was Sydney Lanier yeah Sydney, I think yeah. Sydney Lanier beat Northview three out of every four times they played each other well we lost to them I know in 1981 when we won the state championship we're 13 and one and we lose to them 28 24 I still remember that game like it was yesterday mm -hmm. uh and really I could probably go back and just about tell you all the plays that we ran because um we, you know one thing Harry Wayne never would listen to he never would listen to to Bubba or Randy or myself or anybody criticizing officials he just wouldn't that was just not something that he allowed mm -hmm. uh and you never, very rarely ever heard him say anything bad about an official, ever. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, when you go to Crampton Bowl, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to play. And uh, it, I ended up officiating some high school and, and baseball with those guys in Montgomery. And um, they made it pretty, pretty clear that there's nobody from Dothan go come up here and whoop us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, that there was some there were some things that were mighty odd about that game. I'll just tell you that. Well, with you being the, the ninth grade uh, football coach, what, if any, Friday night responsibilities did you have during the varsity games? Yeah, I was in the press box. I was I was either talking to Jerry or uh, Jerry Andrews or, or Harry Wayne. And uh, that that was great for me. That was great for me because it gave me the opportunity to be in the press. And that's really the best place to be uh, if you want to be a part of, of calling a game. And, and later on, even when I became a head coach, during our spring games, I would always go to the press box and, and, and do everything that needed to be done from there. But, yeah, I was on the phone with offensive coaches. And uh, when you got a Doug Jones and you got a Jonathan Parker and uh, you got people like that, uh, Ron Eli that could fly. I mean, you're talking about just people that could run. Uh, Jonathan Woo Woo and uh, Ron Eli were as fast as any two human beings in the state of Alabama. And Doug Jones, you better stop the dive before you stop anything in the wishbone. And Doug Jones made sure they didn't stop it very often. Yeah, no, that's that's so true. Now, was Coach Johnson, was he up in the press box as well as the defensive, yeah, well, defensive yeah, side? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bubba was up there, but I had to move as far away as I could from Bubba because Bubba would 
Bubba was theatrical and he was very smart and uh, he let Randy and him know <laughs> in a lot of different ways what he thought. Uh, well, if, if, the was, two of y'all, if the two of y'all are in one room and the opposing team is on the other in the other room and then you've got yeah. the on-field announcer or the radio guys in another room, that's a lot of folks and not a big press area. <laughs> So could you yeah. hear each other accidentally or, or if you got too animated? Um, I think people heard Bubba a lot more than, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, you heard a lot. Probably, we probably said a lot of things we shouldn't say, but uh, uh, I, I can remember one time we were playing somebody and I can't remember who it was. And this kid comes to the press box and he's got a note and it's from a, a booster and said, here's a play that y'all need to run. <laughs> and I don't know if I ever gave that to Coach Parrish or not. Uh, I think probably I put that in file 13. But uh, I was going to say, yeah. I'm not sure that that was probably a wise move on your part. Yeah. At, I don't know. at what point, and I don't know if the average fan knows this or even the average player knows this, at what point toward the end of the first half and then toward the end of the game, did you guys make a decision to come out of the press box and head down toward the field or the or the clubhouse? Well, it all depends on what you know what side of the ball's got the ball. You know, if, if we're on offense, we're going we, we're going to stay in the press box until that series is over. Um, you know, you just you leave at the you really try to leave before halftime to beat the crowd. You get to Rip Hughes and it's packed. You got to. But we had a the great thing at Rip Hughes. You could go down a um, a ladder, some stairs on the back of the stadium to get to our dressing room. So oh, that, no. that eliminated that. I, I didn't realize that. I figured you just had yeah. to walk through the crowd to get down. To uh, down it wouldn't there. have been good to walk through the crowd, I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was, what, was there anything unique about the Rip Hughes Stadium crowd or playing a Friday night game at Rip Hughes as opposed to Crampton Bowl or Legion Field? Was there anything – uh, that stood out or that was of any uniqueness in your memory? Well, you know, after leaving Northview and, and coaching in different places, we always believed it was really hard to win in Dothan. It was hard to beat a Dothan or a Northview team in Dothan because they played so well at home. I mean, obviously the crowd played a, a, a major role in that, but those kids just felt, you know, you played there, Bernard, you know exactly what it was like. When you went into Rip Hughes, you felt like they were coming into your backyard to start a fight, and you didn't want to lose a fight in your own backyard. And uh, Dothan and Northview both played extremely well um, uh, in Rip Hughes Stadium, and it was um, it was they had a definite home field advantage because that's exactly the way they felt. It's kind of like we feel at UMS Wright. Mm -hmm. When you come into UMS Wright, you see those beautiful columns there, and we just feel like we have a huge home field advantage. And, and I think that's what the kids felt like at Dothan. When they walked into Rip Hughes, that was their home field and there wasn't anybody going to take it from them. You know, one of the things that I always appreciated was the home uh, dugout or clubhouse was directly below the band and the student section. section. Yeah. And those couple, and of, games couple of games where we were the away and had to dress in the other yeah. – clubhouse on the other side of the same side of the field, but the other side, I always thought that was just, I didn't like that at all. I, no, I, that was I, weird. Yeah. yeah, that, that was weird. That was, that's kind of odd that that, um, having to sit on the visitor side at that time, but that's just when you have two teams that play from the same city, yeah. it's only fair. I, I grew up in Sylacauga and mm -hmm. that's what we had to do with BB Comer. Sometimes we were the home team, sometimes we were the visiting team, but, uh, uh, it, it was a little bit, <laughs> a little bit different there. That's right. And you mentioned something about the band. Mm -hmm. um, we always called him band man, but you're talking about probably as fine a band director as I've ever been around was at Northview and his name escapes me right now, but I can see it. John Christian. John Christian. That's exactly right. And you know, John Christian knew exactly when a team was driving against us <laughs> And, you know, they changed that rule later on, Bernard. Uh, when a team's got the ball and they're about to score, John Christian had the band as loud as they could get it, especially if they were on that end of the field. 
and they changed that rule a little later on. You couldn't be playing while the ball was in play. So uh, he certainly knew his football. But coach, got some folks who've just rolled in and want to say hello to you. Kevin Jackson, Kevin Harris, Butch Henderson, and wow. oh, Bruce Johnson rejoined. It's all some some names from the past. Yeah, Kevin Jackson's probably one of the best football players that ever came out of Dothan, Alabama. I'm, I'm telling you, just an amazing you much arguments player. against that, that's for sure. He was some kind of special player, and I loved watching him in college, and he sure represented Dothan in, a, in that whole community in, in Northview in a very, very unique and classy way. He sure did, and, and I enjoyed my talk with Kevin recently. But one, one last unique thing that I always remember about Rip Hughes was the smell that came from the bread plant that wasn't too far away. You could always smell that bread. And I know a lot of folks walked over there to get bread at halftime. Yeah, that's uh, that was unique about Rip Hughes. You're exactly right. And then for those of us who probably shouldn't have been smelling it, cinnamon <laughs> rolls and things like that were something that, uh, yeah, that's a good memory, Bernard. Coach, uh, Blake Binge says to tell you hello. He just rolled in to join us. Uh, just some wonderful, wonderful young people. I'm telling you, those are, uh, you know, I hadn't, even, I hadn't even mentioned a kid that was probably, you know, yeah, I think about the 81 team and I, you think about that secondary, Tim Whaley, uh, good gracious, three guys in Amerson back there, they could cover anybody. And uh, I don't think I've ever been around a better secondary than Floyd Griffin had in, in that in that on that 81 team and then he had a pretty good player named Brent Gilbert who was a pretty doggone good football player and I, I, I would I'd be remiss if I didn't mention those kids yeah there's there's just so many names it's hard to hard to, to recall them all but I know you're thinking of them right now coach how how many uh how many years did you stay at Northview or how how far into uh your tenure did you stay there I was there for three years and then my my wife's dad relocated to Prattville and uh, we took a job in Prattville. And uh, it was a, a matter of fact, we won the state championship our first year there in 84. And then of course you guys came and won the next in 85, you won the state championship. So uh, Prattville was a unique place. It was not, it definitely was not uh, Dothan uh, for sure. Uh, but it was a unique place and we enjoyed our time there. We were there about eight years, but uh those three years at Northview were years that I needed. I needed for a lot of reasons uh, as a growth. And uh, I learned a whole lot from Harry Wayne and from Randy and Jerry and those guys. And it sure helped me as I, as I, and I became a much better coach as a result of being around those people. Well, that, that's what I was just getting ready to ask you. Those three or, or four years that you were in Dothan at Northview with all of those great coaches, you had to have, I would have assumed, you had to have taken some lessons, some things that you learned and maybe applied when you went to Prattville and ultimately at, at USM Wright. Uh, what were some of the, the things that you took away that, that you really appreciated or, or enjoyed about that, that staff? Well, I think one of the things that I learned real quick was uh, how important track and field was, how important Floyd Griffin was to that school because, you know, all the athletes that didn't play a spring sport they went to the track. They were there, and, and Coach Griffin had them doing whatever he needed them to do, and, it, and really it helped them become better football players. Uh, but, heck, if you're around Floyd Griffin, you're just going to be a better individual because you get the chance to be with him. I mean, that's, uh, that's the kind of man he was. I think organization. I think uh, one of the things when I became a head coach that, that I really tried to apply was the way Harry Wayne was organized how he spent time with his coaches. You know, we spent a lot of time out at the new complex out there at the old airfield. We, our coaches would go out there. Mr. Oaks let us go out and play racquetball, mm -hmm. swim, and just spend time together. And that's something that Harry Wayne made sure that we did. Uh, so organization, spending time with your assistant coaches. And uh, I think as much as anything, uh, making sure that your kids knew that you cared about them and it was real. It wasn't anything that was any false pretense or anything. Uh, Harry Wayne made sure that his coaches cared about the players and uh, it started with him. And that's kind of what we got. You know, and it's, it's, it's such kind words you had for the coaches and that experience. 
and it sounds like it didn't matter what sport you were coaching, a lot of those principles would hold true, whether it was on the sports field or in the classroom, or really any time that you're leading young persons in some type of education or sports program. Uh, so it really sounds like some awesome life lessons right there. Well, and that, that's, I think that's probably what I learned as much from Harry Wayne and from Randy Hicks too. I mean, Randy came over from the middle, from one of the junior highs where he was the head coach and became the defensive coordinator. And Randy was intense. I mean, he, he was intense and, you know, and watching him practice, you just, he was organized to the point that he, he, he knew exactly what he wanted to accomplish every day. And one of the things that I, I can still remember hearing Randy say is we want to get just a little bit better every day. We get a little bit better every day. Then by the time it gets to crunch time, we're going to be pretty doggone good. And uh, the proof was in the pudding with that. All right, I'm going to jog your memory about two things because I truly don't know the answer to this. And if you don't know, hopefully somebody in our crowd will be able to, to answer this. During the preseason, during, I guess it would have been maybe in the spring or maybe in, uh, in the fall practice as conditioning is really ramping up, there used to be this station to station two minute drill where you would go to different coaches around the practice field and you would spend X period of time, like 45 seconds, jumping right. over a log or doing whatever. And there was a name for that. Do you remember us doing that? Do you remember the name that it was called? I've been it's thinking. County, the County Fair? I, I don't. That's what, that's what we called it. That For years, that's what I've called it, County Fair. Now, I, don't, I can't remember what Coach Parrish called it. I can't. Keith Rice, around the horn. Thank okay. <laughs> and I remember it. I just remember hating every minute of it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. most folks did. Now here's here's the other thing. If when you were on the ninth grade, and this may be even applied when you were up in the varsity, if you mispracticed, if you were late, if you didn't do something you were supposed to, you guys would make us lay down on the goal line, pads and all, helmet on, and roll. And just roll and roll. And I think you either had to go 50 or 100 yards, but you would be sick within 20 yards. It was the most god awful punishment I had ever. It was torture. And I don't know who came up with that, but but do you remember players having to do that? Oh, absolutely. And everywhere I went after that, we did that too. I mean, that was, yeah, it was. A matter of fact, we had players that would call us Coach Roll. I mean, that was, uh, yeah, that was. Uh, that's 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 pretty tough. That's, oh, it's like horrible. kind of doing the spin on the baseball bat, you know, how you do that. Uh, but, um, yeah, yeah. Well, thankfully, I only had to do it once or twice. I don't remember why, but I remember guys who had been doing it or maybe used to it said, if you put your hands out and kind of make a, 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 a hole and look through the hole, as you're in, that helps. That's garbage. None of that helps. <laughs> That's pretty tough. I, you're right. Rolling was pretty tough. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I think that if you tried to make players do that now, that who knows, somebody might complain to somebody and then be an investigation. You know, it's just <laughs> like that they're, they're not allowed to do a lot of the things that was uh, par for the course or pretty normal uh, back in the day, so to speak. But I know that's a fine line you as a coach and an administrator have had to walk uh, for all of your coaches and programs over the years. Well, that's true. I can tell you who did a lot more roles than – some others. Paul Dunseth did probably as many roles as anybody that I know. <laughs> well, I know Philip Braswell and Blake Bench, who were about Paul's age. Oh, Y'all remember Dunseth yeah. and others. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Dunseth, he's a pretty good football player, too. He, he sure yeah. was. He sure was. But I guess you, you get it. You get the whole package with yeah. with uh, because we're getting close to the end of our, our chat here, and I really appreciate your time and taking us through a little bit of, of some memories. But here's where I want to I want to leave you with I, any particular plays or games or situations that really just stick out in your memory that from your time at Northview. I'd love to love to hear any of them if you got any in your head. Well, I think I think when we were at Chris County and David Alford just when he tore his leg up, broke his leg there, and 
golly, what David Alford has gone and done now as an orthopedic surgeon and just an amazing young man. And but uh, Wade Dickey Lillard came in and took over, and um, you know, I, you know, I just thought that Jerry Andrews and Harry Wayne did such a great job just mentoring him at a time when it was it was a tough, tough situation for Dickey to come in, and, and he did a great job of that. Um, now, you got to remember, I think I remember the Murphy game. One of the reasons I remember Murphy so well is because a guy that I coached with here at UMS Wright, Terry Curtis, was uh, one of the coordinators for Murphy at that time, and they had a – their quarterback was Pat Washington, of course, who went on and played at Auburn, a great quarterback, as you well know, Bernard. Uh, and they had two great receivers, a boy named Joe Smith and the other guy that was phenomenal as well. We were able to beat them 17 to 14 there at Rip Hughes. And all the Mobile people swear that, you know, Murphy should have won that game because of a call in the end zone. But Bubba and I were sitting upstairs watching it. And uh, the call was right. And to, to beat a team, Murphy was really, really good that year. And uh, to beat Murphy that year was was probably as a fine a game as I can ever remember being in. And how could you forget Larry Roberts? How could you forget, I mean, probably one of the greatest high school football players I've ever been around. And uh, a pretty doggone good basketball player, too, I might add. Say so you um, had the pleasure you got to coach him up a little bit on the hoops. Yeah, well, he was, he was something special. I can tell you, he and Paul Huffam and th those guys were pretty doggone good. I can tell you that. Uh, but uh, Larry Roberts had never – I don't think he'd ever kicked. And Randy took him out one day, and he said, Larry, just – just he put on one of the toes. You know, we used to have the square-toed shoes. Mm -hmm. He kicked a 60-yard field goal in practice. And <laughs> just Randy, <as> good. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I mean, um, you know, a, a tremendous defensive player. We played him at tight end. He scores a big touchdown, I think uh, – uh, in the state championship game, you know, t phenomenal players. I think I remember the players much more than I do. I think that's why we're in coaching because of relationships. And, you know, Bernard, you've had a great relationship with all your coaches. and um, But the relationships that you have with players is something that um, you just never – you never forget. And there's a kid that went to Northview that I've stayed in touch with. He's called me a, a hundred times, Finn. I don't know if you remember Finn – I can't think of Finn's last name right now, but Finn it seemed like everywhere I coached, Finn would show up and come by and talk and give me a hug and things like that you don't ever forget. So the relationships, I think, were more was it important. Finn Church? Church? It is Finn Church. That's exactly who it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly who it is. Yep. Very good. Very yeah. Good. Well, Coach, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you this evening. I, I really enjoyed it. Same here, Bernard, and thank you for, for joining our show. Uh, we really enjoyed you being on Prep Sports Report, and uh, let's do it again. It's been great. Any, anytime. Well, guys, y'all heard from one of the early early coaches, Coach Rick Cleveland, who has had a, a fantastic coaching career uh, over the past, I think you said, what, 42 years now you've been in sports or coaching 42. on one level or another. Yep. It sure has. It's been a great one. What a tribute. What a legacy. And, and I can continue success, health, and everything else. And I hope to break bread with you one day. I get down to Mobile and maybe come by and see you and Keith and some others down there. Thank you guys for stopping by for another episode. Weekly, we do these conversations with Cougars. We take some trips down memory lane. And I, I'm trying to reach out to, to some of the guys or cheerleaders, whoever was part of the program during the 2000s. I know that Facebook is not a not the, the younger generation's place to be, but hopefully we can find some folks uh, over the next couple of weeks. But we've got Mike Henry, Chris Lee. We've got a whole bunch of folks lined up over the next several weeks. So thank you for all of your comments and watching and keep putting your pictures and videos and any memories you have on the site. I love to see all that stuff. I know a lot of us do. Well, guys, have a, have a safe week. Be, be smart. We're, I know each... I know our state is starting to roll out into society, but just be smart about things. Hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get back to some sense of normalcy in society soon. Y'all have a great evening and we'll talk to you another time. Be well. Take care.